coming and joining us. I think for many, first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Khaled Fatal. I'm the group chairman of the Multilingual Internet Group. The subject matter we're here to discuss is something that is uh, very close to many people's heart who attend IGF. And um, this is going to be more of a debate and a discussion and more of like a, uh, uh, a focus group to try and come up with some possible scenarios of how to make the multi-stakeholder model more transparent in its processes, more relevant to local community, and at the same time um, reflect what I would call uh, the new religion. Multi-stakeholderism in my book and in many people's books is really a new adopted faith. It's a me mechanism of way of thinking and a way of approaching of how um, representation takes place. And while it's still work in progress, I think uh, we all believers that it has a uh, tremendous opportunity to make and leverage the internet that we know into something more powerful and pr provide representation uh, by people across the world. So the subject matter here today is how do we make multi-stakeholderism more equitable and transparent? Many of you who probably uh, looked at the program and were interested in coming in and having this debate would recognize that policy decisions in internet governance or climate change directly affect daily lives of billions. To expect a high level rule of observance, a high level of public participation is mandatory. Thus, ownership of the adopted, uh, thus ownership of the adopted rules. Risks from and on multi-stakeholderism are paradoxically related to the very nature of this model, the openness and inclusiveness. Without enshrining equality, equitability, transparency in multi-stakeholderism, any engagement can be easily hijacked by small groups. To put it mildly, you know, we've all heard the expression, you are as strong as your weakest link. With multi-stakeholderism taking root in so many different communities around the world, it's, 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 it's paramount that the, the processes that take place in local IGFs are as transparent as possible, adhering to a standard of some sort, that they are actually s strengthening the global IGF rather than creating a weakness in it. So this workshop here is how, what we're trying to debate is how to come up with mechanisms towards more equ equal, equitable, and transparent uh, 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 multi-stakeholder model. We have a great panel here today. I will give them the opportunity to, to, um, uh, uh, to announce themselves and uh, tell us who they represent and when they're speaking on on their own behalf or whether on behalf of their organizations. At the same time, part of the, pro the program today is to actually address the relevant subject matter that's of the day. When we're talking about multi-stakeholderism, we're talking about faith, trust, representation. The latest revelations about the surveillance that we've been hearing about that uh, many of us are finding very distasteful cannot be taken away from this conversation, and they, they are part of this conversation. So part of what I want to actually present to, the, to you in the audience and the, the, to the panelists is how do we need, how should we address the subject matter of um, the surveillance and the way it has been revealed and the way it, it, it challenges the uh, multi-stakeholder model um, which, again, in my personal opinion, I treat it like a cancer that needs to be looked at and figured out of how to deal with it because it can challenge the trust in the whole process and the whole system. So that's my personal opinion. I will leave it to the panelists to actually address this and then give us their thoughts. So we'll start first with, um, I'll ask the panelists to start from the left. Uh, Thomas, would you please? Yes, hello everybody and good morning. Uh, my name is Thomas Schneider. I work for the Swiss government, Ofcom, which is the regulator for electronic media 
and Telecom and Information Society, but it's also the ministry of these issues and sometimes also the foreign ministry. We are a small country, so we do many things at the same time. And I represent Switzerland in a number of fora, including ICANN, Council of Europe, UN, uh, and so on. Do you want me to? Yeah, carry on here, please. <coughs> with, a, with regard to um, religion, I was raised Catholic, but uh, I decided not to be that religious um, the older I get. <coughs> so I, uh, for me, multi-stakeholderism is not a new religion, but it's very funny how this term is spread and at the same time how there is no agreed or only a, a limited agreed shared common understanding of what, what that actually should mean. And, and we spend much more time discussing how good this is than to actually uh, agree on what we actually mean by it and where the limits of multi-stakeholderism are or what the principles or the basics of multi-stakeholderism are. And I think, um, and I hope we have a, a good discussion here, but not only here, we, we need to get to a more common understanding how to improve the multi-stakeholderism so that it is actually a, a valid alternative to, to more ancient uh, uh, processes or structures like multilateralism because there are many people that are still not convinced of the real benefits of multi-stakeholderism because it's most of the time not really properly done or no, the potential of multi-stakeholderism is, is, uh, multi is not fully used. <coughs> I'll leave it at that for the moment. I think we'll get uh, to more debate yeah. once everybody has. Thank you. <coughs> Musa, please. Hello and, hello and good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Musa Abdullah. I'm from the uh, TRA in Bahrain, and uh, mostly I, I represent Bahrain in the ITU and other fora such as the IGF. Multi-stakeholderism is actually a very, it's a hot topic these days, but it's been a hot topic for the last eight years or more. And I think Thomas hit on a very important point, which is, we keep talking about this definition of multi-stakeholderism. As Khalid was saying, it seems to be you know, talked about with the passion and fervor of, of uh, faith. Mm -hmm. If you really break down the term, it doesn't mean anything in and of itself. It just means you have several different stakeholders. Well, that's a project. You know, every project's gonna have uh, mul multi-stakeholders. Any decision you make that affects more than yourself is gonna have more stakeholders. The problem is not in the term. The problem is in the mechanism. Now, in many of these fora, you hear reference to the Tunis Agenda. And the reason you hear that is because it's the one document that was ratified at a high level that actually lays out the responsibilities. But it laid them out as a simple phrase or a simple sentence for each of the stakeholders. So now it comes to how do we operationalize some of those things, which is why you hear about, for example, the, the Brazilian pr proposal. Because there is some vagueness in the mechanism of this. So my preference is not to use the term multi-stakeholder. My preference is to use the word inclusivity. Because really that's what we're aiming for. Everyone who is affected by it, whether they're a decision maker or someone who is impacted by that decision, should have their say in this. And I think with that, I'll uh, hand over to the rest of the panelists. Yeah. I'll talk a bit more on Thank it later. Thank you, Musab. Would you, would you, for example, add the term representation to inclusiveness? Of course. Uh, uh, the, I think the real key here is respect. At the end of the day, everyone who impacts or is impacted by these decisions, should their, their point of view should be respected. You don't, you don't necessarily have to agree with it. At the end of the day, every country is going to have a different agenda. Every group is going to have a, dif a different viewpoint and, and uh, different needs and wants. But we need to respect the fact that they have concerns. If we dismiss them, that's undermining the entire model to begin with. Correct. Correct. Thank you. Well, that, that's coming from uh, government as well. That's very positive. Thank you. Uh, Walda? Please. I'm Walda Roseman. I'm with the Internet Society. And... Um, I, first of all, want to thank uh, Thomas and Musava for your comments. I think you've actually led right into what I wanted to say. Uh, uh, Thomas, you talked about multi-stakeholderism as, if I could use another term, a buzzword at this point. 
And I, re I have been, I dare to say, I've been around long enough that I remember when competition was a new concept yep. in the market. And competition uh, was considered a tool and probably uh, the best tool that could be used in any s circumstance in trying to open up uh, opportunities for uh, telecommunications and broadcasting uh, in, in the marketplace. And this dates back, dare I say, to the 70s and the 80s. And then as it evolved, we watched it become an objective and lost along the way what it was we were trying to accomplish when using it as a tool. And so I think it's very useful here for us to take uh, the term multi-stakeholderism and begin to pull it apart uh, as a tool, a key tool for much better decision making, decision making that leads to uh, um, implementation that is much more pragmatic and essentially more effective. Uh, uh, my own sense is that multi-stakeholderism is um, highly situational. Uh, the principle is to bring in all of those who have a stake in the outcome and who might well have a solution for the outcome. But it does make a difference what the outcome is that you're seeking, who's seeking it, what the process is that's put in place, and who drives that process, mm -hmm. and as part of that process, full knowledge of who's ultimately going to make the decision, uh, whether it's a shared uh, set of decisions or a, a, a central decision. Um, that the, the questions that uh, Khaled gave us here used words like, how do you keep small special interest groups from hijacking uh, a decision, um, and I, th I found that a little bit confusing because you don't. You just have a process in place where there is transparency of the process and who drives the process and how that clarity, uh, how that decision takes place. So I'll stop there. Yeah, thank you, Walter. I think this is, this is exactly what we wanted to debate because um, the processes that are being, put it this way, put out to be followed are still, as Musab may have mentioned, uh, uh, referred to earlier on, they're really more like high-level guidelines. And the challenge here is you can still, at local level, um, have those kind of uh, uh, processes that might appear to be multi-stakeholder approach. But until you dig deeper to say, well, what was followed? So this is something we want to debate, and we'll come, we'll come to that a bit later. But to get to, get to the subject matter, I, what I would like to read to you is the five key points that we want to actually uh, create the debate about. And by the way, this is open to you guys, not only the, the panelists. So uh, point one, how can we prevent the openness and inclusiveness of the multi-stakeholder model being hijacked by underrepresentative groups that have the resources, leverage, or will to impose themselves or those with the loudest, vo loudest voices. Um, remember, this may not be very common in the Western Hemisphere, but it can be very common in emerging markets where processes are not as transparent. And this is, this is important. Point number two we want to discuss is how can we prevent multi-stakeholderism being leveraged for gains for special interest groups instead of serving the global public interest? Because if we don't do that, then we are actually curtailing the value of the global multi-stakeholder model. Number three, how can we protect multi-stakeholderism to become a stronger emancipator and defender of the global public interest? Four, how do we ensure equality, equitability, transparency, and transparency in multi-stakeholderism? And five, um, we say great ideas need great names. Is there a better name that we can come up with, or are we happy with just the term multi-stakeholderism so that people can uh, feel that they're adopting to this, what we'll call it, the new faith? Uh, faith in progress, right? So, and something else that we need to interject is how to ensure that the faith in that model is not curtailed by other events like what we, the revelations we've heard about the, um, the, the surveillance uh, uh, issues. So here what, I'm, what I've done is I've laid out 
the five key points, I think you're, you're able to see them from the um, uh, online, from the um, uh, agenda of, the, uh, of this event. And what we want to do is create it into a, uh, a debate. So you guys in the audience are also asked to give us your interjections, agree, disagree, or at least uh, give us your thoughts. And maybe if you want to interject something else new. So I'm going to open it up to the, to the panel on some of these key points and see who would like to, um, to, to take a first crack at it. Please, Thomas. Thank you. First of all, um, when, when I uh, reread this, uh, there are two things that strike me. First of all, the multi-stakeholder model doesn't exist. There are hundreds, uh, at least, around. Uh, one example, when ICANN is talking about we are the multi-stakeholder model, uh, I always tend to answer them, um, you are not a multi-stakeholder institution, you are a private institution. This is a multi-stakeholder model with private sector leadership, which is something completely different. I too also has at least some uh, uh, ways of incorporating businesses uh, definitely and also they, uh, they also open up to, to some extent to, to, to uh, uh, NGOs and, 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 and academia and so on and so forth. So this is also a multi-stakeholder model, but it's a multi-stakeholder model with a clear government leadership and there are many uh, uh, models in between. And Good so far I haven't really seen yet, apart from things that I don't, that I don't know uh, too well like IETF or, or these technical bodies that I don't know too well, but on a political level, I haven't seen a model that is a multi-stakeholder model on equal basis. Mm -hmm. At least nobody, uh, may, maybe it exists, but I haven't seen it yet, or, or maybe I'm blind, or, or uh, it's in a different language or whatever. But So what, what I personally would understand as the multi-stakeholder model would be one where decisions are taken with all stakeholders on equal level. ICANN is not that, that but I too isn't, the UN isn't. Um, this is something that I want to, I want to, uh, keep as, as first. And then the second nice thing is the global public interest is also in the AOC of ICANN. We act in the global public interest. There is no such thing as the global public interest because depending on, depending on who is defining the, the global public interest, you will have uh, very different global public interest. Yes. So, um, but as, as uh, Anna said, it's, it's a question of who is driving a process, who is shaping and making the decisions. And um, because you can't uh, uh, discuss with the whole world. So you, you somehow need, and I think that's a crucial thing, you need to have ways of rep people representing other people, people representing stakeholders, and through the mechanism that you basically channel these representations, you get different results. This is one, uh, the oldest multi-stakeholder model that worked more or less well is democracy with parliaments where basically all stakeholder in a country, if, if women are allowed to vote and if foreigners would be allowed to vote, which is still not the case in most of our countries, then, then all the inhabitants of one country, all the stakeholders would be uh, represented in the parliament, which would then be represented in the government somehow. Sure, sure. But this only works to a certain percentage. But um, <coughs> and and, and this system of representation has its flaws because in the end, the government, we discussed this with, with some friends last night, a government doesn't necessarily do what its people want in the end because of the, of the, of the means of representation and representation We've of seen representation. That many, many times, yeah. And it's the same in, in, in a multi-stakeholder model. D depending on a flawed or biased representation, you don't get uh, results that are correspondent with the most relevant you, you're, making, you're making some excellent points, and I think uh, I will interject on a couple of them. Uh, maybe I can shed a bit more clarity on some of the areas that I think I can shed more clarity. Uh, and I'll, I'll give the floor to the, uh, to the other panelists and to you in the audience. I think, no, I think your, your, your point is quite valid about the different versions of multi-stakeholder approaches. However, when, you start, when we start observing the term multi-stakeholderism, being used in a singular term, I think then that becomes, that is being promoted as the new faith. And unless it is promoted as something that can represent or can uh, be a process for representation with transparency in the processes from local to global, then it has challenges. Secondly, on the issue of the, uh, the, the global public interest, in actual fact, within ICANN, 
it's only in the last maybe a year or so you started hearing the term global public interest being used. And uh, I don't want to take all the credit for it, but I've been pushing on ICANN to actually recognize that their role, because of their mandate and where their outreach and how they can impact other communities around the world uh, through their mandate with the, with the DOC, does impact of, on the public interest in local communities. Therefore, their, their impact is on a global level. Now, do we need to more create more definition about the public interest at a global level? Yes, but the impact is at a global level. So I think you're making some very, uh, very valid points. And um, yes, thank you. Mosam. Thank you. Thank you very much, Khalid. Um, Thomas makes an excellent point about there being uh, multiple models of multi-stakeholderism. So it really comes down to which definition are we using. The, w the first point I'd like to touch on is when Thomas mentioned uh, equality. It's not necessarily the case, at least in, in my opinion, uh, that we need e um, equal power between all, all the decision makers in every model. So, okay, I mean, I, I imagine that's, that, that's made a few people, you know, perk up their eyebrows and say, what? Well, think about it. If it's a technical decision, why do governments really care? You know, sh shouldn't the technical community be leading the decisions in that? Don't they have the expertise? If it's public policy, shouldn't governments take lead in that? You know, if it's, uh, I don't know, ci civil issues, shouldn't civil societies take lead in that? The point is, there are people with more expertise whose decision or advice should actually take more weight. And this is why we keep going back to the Tunis agenda, because it actually uh, reflects this level of expertise in the de decision-making process. Now, the problem is, and again, we keep talking about the multi-stakeholder model, as, as if there's, there's only one. And if you don't subscribe specifically to that model, you're not in support of the multi-stakeholder model. Now, I mentioned yesterday, and I'll, I'll repeat today, that coming from an Arab country, I've, ha I've had people ask me, why doesn't Bahrain support the multi-stakeholder model? My answer to that is, not only are, are we on record as having supported it, we've had it in practice ever since the founding of, of the TRA which is now coming up on, on 10 years. Every decision that we make, we issue for public consultation. And we open it to everyone. We open it to the industry, to the operators, to, to your average consumers, and we, uh, we get responses, even from individuals. They're like, why do you as TRA do such and such? Why don't you do X, Y, Z? And by law, we are required to issue a response to every single consultation question that we receive and we are held accountable for it. We don't necessarily implement it, but we must respond to it. So, how do we, how do we go forward on this? Coming from, th th this is a personal opinion, as opposed to an, an administrative opinion, and this is partly based on the fact that I come from a project management background. I think we need to have clear leadership on any particular area, any particular topic. If the leadership isn't clear, your decision's not, not gonna be clear, and your implementation's gonna be less so. So I'm going to leave that as, a, as food for thought, and I'll let the other... I, I think that's a very, very uh, uh, excellent example. I'm, I'm, I did not know that about how you operate within the TRA uh, in Bahrain. That for 10 years, that's exactly your, your mechanism of consultation. And it just uh, uh, brings me back to uh, observations that I, um, I made when I was attending the Wicked Summit in Dubai. Um, and interestingly enough, going back to labeling, and you're either with us or against us. I felt a lot of the debates in Wicket where if you don't support the multi-stakeholder model, the way it's promoted, you're the antichrist. It's like you know, your government, you're not supporting it, you're not with us. And I felt it was very, very uh, a negative approach, especially when you hear that there are uh, 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 many jurisdictions that implement uh, uh, their version of a multi-stakeholder model, which should be celebrated and brought in Ra uh, uh, into the fold. So um, I, th I, uh, I think that's a, that's a good example. I'm glad you, you mentioned that. Um, Walda, the floor is yours. You see, one of the beauties of multi-stakeholderism is you can choose not to take the floor. 
Would you like to give me the microphone? Yes. <laughs> ah, here we go. <laughs> Jovan. Um, I, I mean, I can only agree with what, I, what, what I'm hearing here. I think that when we refer to the Tunis agenda, we also hear uh, there is also reference to each stakeholder in, uh, according to their own, uh, their own role, uh, which both clarifies and probably confuses it further. Uh, I'm a former regulator as well and a former policymaker and have been in industry. So I've, I've seen this from a number of, of perspectives. And uh, one of the things I have seen in various models, uh, certainly in the U.S.'s, the FCC's uh, uh, consultative model, is a growing recognition that there isn't just market failure sometimes. There is government failure and uh, that uh, the, the government may have the responsibility of uh, making a decision uh, after full consultation of all stakeholders, but that responsibility, does that mean that they have to uh, lead the decision uh, or the action as a result of that decision? For example, uh, uh, quite often it makes sense uh, to, uh, to forego uh, making a, a, a regulation or a policy and letting the market forces or the technical forces uh, work together or facilitating their working together uh, with the government stepping back. I would, I would concur that, uh, that we have uh, multiple public interests as well, uh, which uh, a, global, a global public interest is a good principle I think that we're in another room right now. We're hearing a discussion of different principles of, uh, of uh, effective internet governance uh, and certainly freedom of expression, uh, uh, the uh, open, uh, global, uh, uh, accessible internet. Um, all of these are principles that one can relate to the global public interest, but how it ends up uh, affecting individuals, uh, may ha 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 there may be differential impacts, and again, it's situational who makes that decision and plays in the execution of that decision has different impacts. I think, uh, uh, Thomas, what you've talked about with ICANN um, uh, is, is, a, is an interesting um, uh, example. Uh, uh, the example is that, it, that Multi-stakeholderism is, by and large, a moving target. It's experimental. Uh, we are learning from those experiments. I think we have a lot of excellent achievements from them. Um, if we look at uh, what we learned, for example, I'll turn to Internet exchange points. We have examples where governments have chosen to move in in good faith to put re uh, regulations on uh, internet exchange points, and those who have foregone making those, and we see much better results for those who have foregone making those regulations. That's a matter of experience. Um, but it's also a matter of a faith in the multi-stakeholder approach on how does one find what is going to work best in a particular circumstance uh, and, and carry that forward. I'm going to actually give this back, but I have a feeling you want Jovan to maybe say something I too will, here. Yeah, I will, I will, uh, actually, I will give Jovan the opportunity to, to, uh, to say hello. Hello. Uh, good morning, and I first apologize to Khalid and to myself for being late, because I'm co-organizer of this, this panel. 50% of our delegation got sick last night in the Vlada, and 50% yes. myself had to take care of, uh, of a bit of, uh, of uh, help and assistance. And apparently, you know, this is probably a good introduction uh, for the multi-stakeholderism. Context ma matter a lot, and as you know, it's today public holiday, which increased complexity of, uh, of our exercise. But my big apology for, no, uh, that's for fine. being, Thank you very being much. late on that. We'll, we'll give you the opportunity as well to, uh, to get into the conversation. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, uh, Walda, I think uh, from what you've just interjected and what I've heard from the other panelists, and something I, I would like to share with you, if we recognize that this, the multi-stakeholder model is an experiment. And it is an experiment that has had some successes to, to start with, and we'll acknowledge that. I'm gonna share a story with you. It takes us back to 1982. I was this young kid at a university, 
and my professor of economics is a gentleman that, whose theories are taught around the world. His name is Arthur Laffer, the Laffer curve. Anybody who studied supply-side economics would have studied the Laffer curve. And back in 82, Professor Laffer used to teach us at the University of Southern California, uh, lecture us on supply-side economics and laissez-faire economics. And he used to also, and he's done fly to DC because he was on the economic advisor to Ronald Reagan and one of the chief architects of supply-side economics. And prior to that, he was also helping Margaret Thatcher implement supply-side economics. And back then, as a student, I, I remember having the debate with him because the concept of competition, supply-side economics, was still a new faith, if you recall. Mm -hmm. And the conversation was, I used to challenge the professor during those sessions in front of all of the other kids, saying, when society ceases to operate in a normal manner, supply-side economics will collapse. And uh, I was born in Syria, by the way, jokingly in front of all of the kids, he would say to me, ah, you Syrians, you're communists, you want to go and <laughs> nationalize everything. And the subject matter here is why it relates to multi-stakeholderism is when you lived in a civil war and you no longer could go and uh, uh, allow for the supply, uh, for supply and demand to actually allocate resources best, what happens is people will have a problem actually being able to function in society. And because it was an experiment, there was a lack of oversight of a component. And that component that I actually identified back then was social responsibility. Now, Dr. Laffey used to argue, oh, no, no, you don't need that. The, uh, so the market will allocate its resources. What we've learned from the economic failures in the last few years, social responsibility was at the heart of why we ended up in the mess we were in. And I recall, and some of you may recall this as well, when Greenspan, Federal Chairman, uh, Reserve uh, Chairman, uh, was testifying in front of Congress only a few years ago about, and he was asked the question, did you not see this coming? And his answer was, we assume people will do what's in their best interest and companies will do what's in their best interest. We did not anticipate the greed factor. And what I'm, why I'm interjecting this and how, where it fits with the multi-stakeholder model is that, or many of its versions, is that because we are now in an experiment, we need to figure out and factor in all the relevant components. And social responsibility is a serious, a, 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 an intricate component, many of us believe, that needs to be factored in multi-stakeholders. I mean, it's not just a laissez-faire approach. Many people who, in many emerging markets, when they talk about uh, uh, they want freedom online, freedom of expression online, they will tell you, it's natural to them say, but we don't want it just to be in absolute terms. We, we want it to be with social responsibility. So again, if we can from this panel, from this debate, interject some new ideas of how we can factor in social responsibility in multi-stakeholderism, we probably would be doing it a much better service so the experiment could become a, a, a good uh, implementation. That's just my interjection. Um, Thomas, yes, please. Just a, a quick reaction uh, to the three of you. I think you're right. Not, not all stakeholders have equal knowledge, responsibilities, and so on on all issues or on all aspects of issues government. And this is why um, Wolfgang Kleinrecht always uh, uh, fo puts the focus on in their respective roles. The question is, what is the respective role? And this is not so easy as to say we love multi-stakeholderism because then it gets very complicated and, and also with differences from country to country. Um, with regard to, to market versus, versus uh, 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 politics, um, I, I uh, happen to study economics and history and I learned in economics that there's something like a homo economicus and I learned in history that this is a theory that sometimes works to some extent, but m many times also not works because it's, it's just a model that is not really, we are not only homo economicus, we all also have social lives and irrational emotions and so on and so forth. So I agree with you on this, but no matter which model you choose, and, and no matter whether you, it's more socialist or more capitalist or whether it's more multilateral or as we, at least more or less commonly defined, multi-stakeholderism, the question is what are the correction mechanisms 
if this model produces results where some people in advance, but many people after their result think that this has been a mistake. So we have to correct it. In a traditional uh, politics, in a, in a democracy in France, if people don't like something, they go and block the streets with, with their tractors. If, if it's an agricultural issue, in Switzerland they start collecting signatures. In other countries, they do other things to show that they are not happy with the decision taken. Online protests is they block access to a website of a company or of a government, which unfortunately is considered a terrorist illegal action while the tractors blocking streets uh, or access to a, a government facility in the real world is not a terrorist action. This is a, a legal uh, way of uh, expressing political uh, uh, opposition, yeah, yeah. something that we are trying to, to look at at the Council of Europe, how to, to get clear lines on, on uh, legitimate protest online, including uh, blocking access to, to, to services and so on. But the thing is, if, if there is a correction mechanism, then Personally, I think it's less important who is in the lead, because everybody who is in the lead, due to representation, due to biased interests of everybody, no model will always produce the best outcomes. But if you have correction mechanisms, if you have ways, and there we are with the inclusiveness, maybe if not everybody has been included in a decision-making process, or if not every issue or, or situation or, or social development has been taken into account in a decision-making process, if you can correct it afterwards, once you realize, mm, maybe uh, then this is a good model. And, and that doesn't, I, I care much less whether the governments are in the lead or private sector is in the lead, as long as everybody has the possibility to say, mm, something is wrong here. If you agree, let's fight for having it changed. And I mean, uh, I can, the applicant guidebook, I was one of those who said, together with Bertrand and others in 2009, we need different categories. Dot Coca-Cola is not the same as dot London, is not the same as dot Swahili, because it's a different use, different risks, different opportunities, different budgets, different target groups. They said, we want to go fast, one size fits all, there we go, and now we see a brand registry uh, group forming itself because they think brand TLDs are something different. Mm -hmm. We've got the Geo TLDs. Okay, if, if this, they didn't listen to us, in 2009, if this is emerging in 2013, that people agree that maybe some categories would make life easier and not more complicated, fine. If this, if this correction mechanism works, the same with, with uh, the question of more governments or more market. In, 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 in Europe, at least in Western Europe, there's, there's a permanent tension between socialism and, and capitalism. In the German area, we call it soziale Marktwirtschaft. Social capitalism is like you have basically you let the market rule, you fight hard about the regulation for the market because no market in the long term works in a more or less fair way without intelligent regulation. But for the ones who don't succeed in the market, the ones that fall out of the system, you need a social security system. And, and this is the compromise between two models. Each of them is, is, is too weak, but if you try to take the best out of both models as, as a neutral correction system, then you can get something that is accepted by the national public or by the global public. So, so yeah, uh, uh, before I give you the microphone, uh, Jovan, I I'm going to try to make it simple so to the audience and to the panelists. Simple, brief keywords. If it was up to you, what are the missing ingredients today in multi stakeholder that you'd like to see factored in? Five tweets. Okay. Uh, first one, avoid the multi-stakeholderism as ideology. Okay. Use pragmatic approach, and I think Thomas outlined mm -hmm. quite mm -hmm. a few building blocks. Uh, good, strong multi-stakeholderism needs strong institutions. Not necessarily institutions and government departments, but institutions as uh, regulations and uh, elements that give people some predictability. I got over the tweet, 140. That's all right. Okay. Uh, Silicon Valley is a good example of the development based on very solid institutions that protect uh, intellectual property, attract investment, and not necessarily having many government departments. When you talk about institution, are you, re are you referring perhaps, uh, correct me if I'm mistaken, processes perhaps? Processes, uh, regulations, um, um, 
overall formats. environment uh, that uh, that can facilitate growth. Okay. And I think it's completely underestimated because uh, very often uh, innovation is associated with uh, some sort of uh, anarchy or creative anarchy, but it requires predictable environment. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, third point, uh, um, uh, uh, rely on, uh, on multi-stakeholderism, but uh, make sure that all stakeholders perform their legal rules. I'm always critical about social responsibility used as a replacement for the core uh, legal obligations. Child labor should be legal, and all of those elements, they cannot be covered by, so by social responsibility of private sector. That's, that's extremely important, and I mm -hmm. think we'll have to apply it also in the ICT sector. Therefore, it is great if we have social responsibility and the private sector adds to the what is legally legal minimum. Correct. But legal minimum has to be... Has okay. uh, we shouldn't be too naive about hierarchy. I know that very often when we speak about ICT, internet governance, multi-stakeholderism, we, we speak about the end of hierarchy. And it's somehow linked. Hierarchy is the natural principle in society. It is uh, the way our society function, and it is recreated in in online world as well. Um, what Thomas indicated, uh, and I think for institutions and the basis for do good democracy, we have example of Switzerland. I'm born in the Balkans, where institutions almost do not uh, do not exist. Now I live in Switzerland, where uh, you have a quite a solid institutions and tradition of uh, of democracy, and those feedback loops that you need in society, they they exist in various ways. Not necessarily through elections, you have referendum, you have public criticism. It doesn't have to be very, very, very formal. But those mechanisms, especially in critical times, must, must function in the interest of everybody. People who are in the power, who have the rules, and those who, who complain. Because ultimately, stability of the system has to be maintained through the, through the active and the open uh, uh, feedback loops. Well, I got carried away. No, no, it's, uh, excellent. Uh, Well, social responsibility is... Uh, it's, it's Back to the question I was asking. Sure. Your key words to the, um, uh, to the missing items that you'd like to see, or items that you'd like to see either that were missing or you would like to see strengthened in the multi-stakeholder model. Okay. You're on the spot. Yeah, let's see. Um, well, social responsibility is definitely one of them. However... Call me a cynic, but uh, um, I don't have great faith in, pe in the, the masses in general uh, living up to their social responsibilities. There, there's always going to be one factor or the other that puts it as the second, third, or lower choice. Uh, and like to, do, to, to put some input on that, um, I'm actually specialized in Islamic banking. And the, the key article of the Islamic system of, of finance is social responsibility. That's the whole point of it. And yet, without legal articles enforcing it, peop you, d you don't necessarily find that every bank that has the Islamic tag is actually living up to their, their social responsibility. So, yes, I think it's very important, but take it with a grain of salt. More importantly, I would say accountability is, is perhaps the key here. Okay, Not only in the decision-making, but also in the repercussions or the uh, the impact of that uh, of that de decision, um, transparency is, is is another, but I would also say clarity is another one. Okay, whose responsibility is it? What is the process? And from clarity, I would actually go on to say documentation. We put things in writing. You know, let let's have a common so reference. Well, this is, this is all coming from a project management background. You know, the, the, the more planning you put into something, the less problems you have down the line. And I think I would add to that, uh, if, if I, I think I've added a lot, of, a lot of keywords here, but education and awareness is key. Okay? You, you can't expect to have multiple stakeholders um, effectively contributing to something if they don't understand what's at stake, what's the impact of the choice, and it doesn't matter if we're talking about your, your layman on the streets or if you're talking about governments. I mean, again, if, if I can talk about the experiences of TRA Bahrain, um, we, we can get challenged on our decisions, and we have actually uh, overturned our own position
based on new input or, or strong enough from position from the public, from the operators, and we will, we will issue uh, a new ruling ba based on that. You know, at the end of the day, we don't have necessarily all the answers. Okay. So I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Um, actually, Manal from the floor. Um, let me bring them. Uh, no, no. Thank you, Yovan. Give them a bit of access. And by the way, this is also open to your to the floor. Anybody else that wants to interject, please raise your hand, and uh, we'll let her. <laughs> yes, Manal, please. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Manal Ismail, and I represent Egypt at the GAC of ICANN. Uh, actually, it's a very interesting discussion. Um, I think we need to be really convinced about the, the approach and sincere in implementing it. Because otherwise, it's taken as more like an excuse to come up with a decision and then label it multi-stakeholder, and then you, you will not be blamed for it later on. We, uh, uh, it's taken more as a recipe, as you said. Mm -hmm. We need uh, three government representatives, three private representatives, one and a half academic, and one and a half, and then it goes. And I like that. And then yeah, yeah, yeah. So. So we, we have to be sincere in wanting to implement this, really. And this comes to what Mossab said, that we need to make sure that people are aware so they participate effectively. We don't want them only attending. We want them participating and saying their opinions. So I, I like what you just said, but I, I need a bit more clarification what you mean. For example, um, the principle of knowing what the ingredients are, as what you just said, uh, three government representatives. When, I'm using this as an when example. When you say ingredients, I become allergic. Ah. <laughs> <So> <laughs> this okay. is exactly my point. It's, it's, it's it, so not just the recipe that you need to follow, and right. then you can label this decision making. So you're not referring to ingredients. You're saying you're saying. For a process, and correct me if I'm mistaken, if I'm mis misreading you, are you saying that for a process to be recognized as having been multi-stakeholder approached, it needs to have representation from different facets of society mm -hmm. to actually carry legitimacy, so to speak? Would you say, w would that be a good phraseology? Yeah. Uh, l l let me get to your point. Please. Regardless the terminology, because... Yeah. I think when we say multi-stakeholderism, we mean that we want everyone to, be, to have the, the, the option to, to participate. So you can either participate or at least know how the decision-making process is and satisfied and you choose not to participate. Correct. So, and this comes to transparency and clear process that's transparent and you either get to participate or not. Mm -hmm. Even if uh, an organization like ICANN, for example, even if they are a multi-stakeholder platform, if, if, if countries, they don't participate in a multi-stakeholder uh, format also, then it's, it's meaningless. And, and what I mean is, for example, if, a, if Egypt, for example, sends only a government representative, then we are not participating in a multi-stakeholder uh, approach. And this comes to the importance of having the same uh, model uh, implemented nationally. Otherwise, even sp speaking at such venues, you're not representing the, the, the views of whatever uh, other stakeholders, I mean, we, we don't have someone, for example, from the private sector attending then. And if this uh, company does not really represent, so it, it has to go all the way down uh, to, to make sure it's inclusive again, Thank as uh, was mentioned. Walder, you'd like to interject? Yeah, Manal, I think you raised some very interesting points. You know, there are some traps clearly uh, in, in how we go about uh, calling something multi-stakeholder. Uh, some of them, I think, are, are difficult to avoid because you cannot fill a room always with all the stakeholders uh, when you're trying to make a decision. But I think that 
that it, it's too easy sometime at least not to be aware of what those traps are. And if I understand you correctly, what you're saying is that there's such a thing as um, uh, 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 representational inclusiveness, meaning, uh, okay, we'll have one from this category, two from this, from this, now we have an inclusive process, which may or may not be the case. You know, uh, The process that leads up to it and leads out of it can perhaps improve that so that you can make sure what's brought into a, a, a consultation uh, is more inclusive. But yeah, I think another trap, of course, is um, consultation after the fact. Um, uh, and we see that uh, 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 quite often. A third one is, I think, uh, having such broad consultation that you can draw any conclusion you want from it. And that's uh, very much of a, 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 an effective leadership approach. I've consulted with everyone. Not everybody agrees. Uh, but uh, we think that, uh, that uh, this is probably the large body. And so what we were going to do anyway is what makes sense. How one avoids that, not altogether clear. I think what's really important is understanding is that these are potential traps. Uh, they may be done in good faith. Uh, and that's not to say that they are intentional uh, always, but but it's important to be uh, be aware of that. But they're well, they're they skew the result. Uh, it may not be the most effective or constructive uh, result, and that's something we all need to get better at, at working at working at. As again, this is experimental as well. I also wanted to raise, uh, 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 pick up on the issue of uh, social responsibility and education. One of the things that, that I personally worry about is the fact that we, even here in this Internet Governance Forum, uh, where we have broader uh, uh, group representation, are still largely talking to uh, the inner concentric circles. And that, uh, that if we really do expect the multi-stakeholder uh, uh, process to work well when we go local and when we, uh, 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 or national or regional or even international, then we need to make sure that those new people who are coming on, uh, the consumers, uh, 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 the, 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 the new professionals in, in every field, understand what it is we are trying to do here uh, in terms of uh, creating an open global uh, uh, representational internet. And I, I would challenge all of us, including my own institution, to get much better at scaling out our message uh, through the institutions. I, I would say that this is a, a, an important role of regulators and of governments, for example, but of also of companies and NGOs. Uh, uh, it's comfortable talking to ourselves, um, sort of comfortable. We don't always agree, but, but nevertheless, uh, we understand these circles, but we're not yet reaching out beyond those who are, frankly, in a short number of years, going to be the ones who are really making the decisions in a decentralized uh, uh, Internet world. You've just added some very, very um, uh, uh, key phraseologies, uh, uh, Walder, and I think, thank you, Manel, for, for your comments. Let me just share something with you from my personal experience, and I'm gonna, I want to pose it to the panelists and to the floor. We really are a close club. How much of a close club it, it, it can be determined of how close is, how small is small? The truth of the matter here is, I can just relate to you some uh, experiences. In 2012, some of you may already know, we, uh, within my group, we, we conducted a major study of the internet usability in, in many regions in the world, primarily uh, Arabic, uh, language community, Urdu language community, and, and, and Farsi language communities. I actually personally flew in to many capitals. I was in Cairo, I was in Beirut, I was in Amman, and I actually held seminars at universities. I was hosted by NGOs, and there were hundreds in the audience. And let me just lay a fact to you. Most people don't know who ICANN is. I don't mean most, vast, vastest majority. If you tell them what is ICANN, we have the data, but less than 3% knew who ICANN is. If you tell them IGF, 
what? The point I'm getting at here is tell them multi-stakeholderism and tell them this is a new mechanism. I'll, I'll give you the floor in a moment. Why I'm actually making this point here is we're really talking to ourselves. So relate this to other activities we're doing. We're, we've, we've ju we announced last month that we're doing a, a, a series of summits around emerging markets around the seismic change to the global internet and the birth of the multilingual internet. The fact of the matter is you go to these local communities and you want to talk about educating them on how to be involved. The organizations that are involved in this, they don't even know that they exist. Most of them use the internet for being on Facebook or illegal downloads. So there's a lot that we have to do. And I, my opinion, and again, I will put it to the floor so that we can create the discussion and maybe come up with conclusions. Is that it is not enough to actually start philosophizing what works. These local people have to actually be given some kind of a format. If you want to go to the blueprint, that say, if you follow this kind of an approach, keep it loose, then you have an opportunity at being represented. If that is an approach, that can give them the, if you want to call it, the, the opportunity to, to, to be representative, to have democracy online, and then start, start participating. And this is taking the, 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 the root in, the in, in, in local society. Um, that's, that's just a thought, and I will put, open it to the, to, the, to the panelists and to the floor. The reality here is we have huge challenges coming from the, uh, uh, to, to in how to deal with emerging markets and local communities and making them, to bring them into the fold so they can be emancipated uh, uh, users of the internet. My thoughts, please, I'll leave it to you. Thank you. This is, uh, you, you started a, a very uh, important discussion, but again, we are in, in, in the question of how to represent the multiplicity of global stakeholders, because if you take my country, we are not the, uh, the poorest country in the world. We're not the biggest one. We can afford two people coming to a GAC meeting from governments. We can support some civil society and others, either financially or, or through other means. We can afford two people coming to an IGF. That's it. And for, for the new GTLDs, I was trying to contact uh, the industry, the banking regulation, because of dot bank, whether that would be a problem. The, when when uh, uh, talking to, to the health sector, whether dot health and, and all these, and they were telling us, oh, sorry, we have a problem with the Germans on tax uh, things, we have a problem uh, on the, no resources, no time. Um, your issue is very nice, but we have other priorities. So you can't send half of Switzerland, and that doesn't only account for, the, for the, to, to an IGF or to an ICANN meeting, it's simply not possible. So you have to find ways of, and it's not, I wouldn't say that we are a close club, because we are not, and we, I'm talking of, of all these institutions. We have remote participation, we have Twitter feeds, we have uh, many ways, we have some have better or less travel support uh, 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 mechanisms. But the thing is, you can't, it's, it's, not, it's not only a question of, of, of money to travel, it's a question of I have to earn my living somewhere and if I spend a week, uh, three times a year in an ICANN meeting, a week, a year in, in an IGF, including uh, all the preparatory process, we don't have the time for this. I'm, I'm paid for this, but actually I don't even have the time to follow whatever I should. Uh, and I would need two more persons at least to do what I suppose that I think I should do, but it's not possible. So we need to find ways to be maybe representative in a better structured way. And, and, and I think the key, to, to quickly, if you allow me to come back on your five points, transparency is a key point, and everybody agrees that transparency is a key point. But what does that concretely mean? And for instance, with the, I, I would have other points, but sticking to transparency. Transparency means, first of all, not that you publish 10,000 pages like I can uh, used to do sometimes. Like we are transparent, we publish, every, publish, uh, publish everything on our website. Fine. But who get, gets, gives me and others the resources to actually go for it and find the things that are relevant for me? Transparency means that it's easily accessible who does what and who does not do what. And this should be accessible to, to everybody. And the second point is extremely important. Where does the money come from that pays those who take the decisions? And where does the money go to that is involved in, that is the result of these decisions? You can also say, 
not only raise transparency but fight corruption. In every system you have corruption. In my government we have corruption. In other governments uh, you have corruption. Also in ITU, in ICANN, in the UN, you always have corruption. If people have easy access to find out what is the money involved, you can take the US governments, you can take election campaigns, party programs. The easier you find out what money is involved, where does it comes fr come from, where does it go to, the more easy the more people are empowered to realize, aha, okay, so um, I have to support these or I have to fight for this what here. What you're talking about, for example, this is fundamental. Like, uh, uh, when the tobacco industry can, uh, uh, when the commission a study about smoking, you want to know that the money that came for the smoking study uh, did come from the, from the tobacco industry, so at least you know they have a vested interest in the conclusion. That's it. Fantastic. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, just a few quick, uh, uh, qu uh, first I'm happy that the Diplos delegation is on the size of the Swiss delegation. We have also <laughs> two persons here. That's really uh, comforting. Now, uh, there are a few keywords, uh, and I will relate to what was already said. But Wanda said about uh, the question of uh, footprint. We can call it, in climate change terminology, global internet governance footprint. Our footprint is still limited for various reasons. I share Thomas' view that uh, representation needs to be established in some way, and it's old, as old as democracy. You cannot have, except in the, all the Athens uh, uh, squares and forums, uh, but even at that time, there were no, no citizens only, those who, were, uh, who had the right to be there. Therefore, that has to be taken with a bit of a realistic, realistic view. But what was important, we have to extend the footprint, and I will give you one example. During the, Bali, uh, the Baku uh, IGF, my biggest achievement was to explain internet governance to three policemen, uh, Azeri policemen, you remember, with big hats. They were vo going around uh, collecting, you know, byros, uh, what uh, goodies that companies have, and they came to our booth, they found the book in Russian, and said, what is it all about? And I said, well, it's about this internet. I said, oh, they told, we realized it's some, this conference is something about the internet. And then what is, uh, they, they continued, but then what is in it? They said, do you have a daughter? Yes, they asked, one of them asked, I said, She's using Facebook, yes, she's using Facebook, and everything is fine, well, not exactly. What is the problem? Few months ago, some guys w was, bo uh, was bothering her, and they said, and what was your reaction? Oof, if I had a chance to ha arrest him, to kill him, whatever else. Then I started to explain to him, it's not that easy, first, that guy is most likely abroad, and it's not the way to do the things, there are the processes. And then he brought two, uh, two colleagues to collect the book. I'm doing the now the same thing here in, in, uh, in Bali. This is a small thing and it's always, uh, I'm the, the, the proud of those achievements. Quick points on, uh, on this is about footprint which is, which is extremely important. I would argue for translucency, not transparency. Translucency, the easiest visualization are those uh, <coughs> shower cabins where you can see just the contours, what's going on, without <laughs> details. Like in my room here. And, <laughs> and and it is sometimes realistically what we can what we can do because that offering uh, what uh, Thomas said uh, we have you have thousand pages it's usually uh, if you uh, done in order to hide the, the most important information if you remember the whole series yes minister uh, 20 years ago that was that was a masterpiece of the of the governance and and manipulation of governance as a matter of fact i'm discussing with a few colleagues to write the yes minister for multi stakeholderism and we have 20 pages <laughs> and uh, and uh, <laughs> starting with that. Uh, the last point which is extremely important whenever I talk to the government officials all over the world, including countries which are skeptical about multi-stakeholderism, I always base it on their interest. And their interest uh, is to have more uh, people who can help limited government capabilities to participate in IG. And uh, uh, having them inside the tent uh, with whatever contextual explanation, civil society, technical <coughs> community, academia, is better than to fight some sort of ideological battle if multi-stakeholderism is threat, to, threat, threat to, the, to their power or not. Ultimately, and this is a risky term, but I will use it, uh, we can learn a lot from the Tea Party, but the historical Tea Party, Boston Tea Party. Oh. And the key slogan of the Boston Tea Party, as you can recall, was uh, uh, no taxation without representation. If you can implement into internet governance and modern politics, 
is no implementation of rules without representation. <laughs> if you want communities to implement the internet governance rules, and we're not speaking about drawing borders between countries, we're speaking about uh, procedures and uh, rules that affect our daily reality, how we live, how we interact, how we share the our sometimes intimacy, you cannot impose it uh, by uh, adopting the law. Therefore, multi-stakeholderism, we have to find some better term, is the key to have a proper implementation. And governments uh, should be aware of that, international organizations. Can you just ask me, if you just more on, when you say no implementation without representation, we all agree on that. Dig deeper with the term representation. What would be the format or the translucent format of representation that can be utilized? Oh, sorry. Thank you. What would be the translucent uh, 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 tra term, uh, uh, ingredients, for lack of a better term, to representation so that if it is followed to a large extent at local level, then what we can conclude is it has been representative. We need to come up with a format, some kind of a format, that can be followed by those who are walking into this new arena Let's not call it faith, let's not call it religion, a new arena, so that representation can serve what you just described, the local entity. So it serves their interest. Can you interject some, some of those uh, mechanisms for representation? Well, Khalid, that I'm very, uh, very skeptical about grand schemes, although I write drawings, but I'm very skeptical of grand schemes. I think what, what we can do, um, uh, I, I, for example, if I had planned, uh, my plans for today were completely changed by developments uh, last night. You know, planning uh, uh, and uh, grand schemes, uh, I have uh, limited faith into that. We have to plan and we have to organize our life, but we have to be aware of the real constraints of life and, uh, and, and development. Therefore, first, nudge, if I can use this famous term now in the U.S. government, nudge good practices, support good initiatives, Avoid ideology and, and big uh, big schemes. Be aware of the of the fakeness of the ideology, which uh, we experience some elements in the in the IG process, mm -hmm. and address that, which you're trying to do with uh, this this uh, this seminar, and uh, and uh, rely on uh, uh, put a more trust into 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 um, um, people's dynamism and creativity in a ways to 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 organize their thought and protect their interests. We, we tend to be paternalistic sometimes about it, and people, people can organize themselves. And if, we, if they are not uh, <laughs> suffocated by, uh, by a sort of um, uh, apathy of uh, uh, too many rules. Well, there are four, four uh, ingredients. If you ask me for some sort of blueprint, uh, um, I, would, uh, I can tell you what we do in Diplo. What we do in Diplo, uh, and we started six years ago, seven years ago, now I can see it's followed by ICANN, ISOC with ambassadors. You bring people, you immerse them into the, into the process, you do uh, first few days hand-holding, then you let them uh, go and do things. And I'm very proud of that achievement. You, you can see in MAG many Diplo representatives. And if you ask me, I was asked once by the big institutions in Geneva to give the recipe for our capacity building. I said it's contradiction in term. I can give you a few hints, but uh, the basically success of our capacity building was high flexibility, clear idea of what we want to achieve, avoiding the grand schemes, addressing the uh, people's interest, developing uh, re respect for our participants, and developing empathy, which I mentioned uh, mentioned yesterday uh, or the, the, the opening session. Those are those are the key elements which are quite <laughs> normal, natural, and human. And uh, if, you, if you expect grand, grand design, I'm afraid I can, I can talk about our courses and the research and this and that, but um, that's not necessarily the way how, how we can achieve a genuine multi-stakeholders. Thank you. Anybody from the floor? Oh, Chuck. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, uh, forgive me. My name is Andrew Sikman, and I'm a retaining ambassador through, um, through the Internet Society. I'm also involved in ICANN through at large and um, the not-for-profit concerns constituency. I just want to raise a couple of points and uh, for comment. Um, I, I agree that, um, that multi-stakeholderism needs to be equitable, but who decides who equitability? Is it the stakeholders or the organization that is leading the process? So for instance, on, in ICANN, is ICANN the one to decide, define who are the stakeholders 
and what hierarchy those stakeholders come under? Or is the stakeholders to decide their own groupings and uh, how equitable they, they deal with each other? Let me help you on that one. Would you say that a country or a, l a region that has, I don't know, 100 citizens should have a, s a lesser voice than a corporation that has uh, 5,000 employees. The truth of the matter here is equitability, the way we see it, and this is mm -hmm. subject to the discussion, equitability is to have the ability so that all voices are being heard and no louder voice that has been <coughs> maybe pushing or uh, funding or something like that has grander access to implementation of their desires taking place. This is just like part of what we're talking about, equitability. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if that's not coming across before, if you want to interject on that, please do, please do. That's really what we think about, to make sure that it's equitable and equal across the board. You know, in my book, and this is my personal opinion, even we have a sense of responsibility to those internet users that are about to enter. They don't have a voice yet. But part of our responsibility in empowering them is we have a responsibility to make sure that they also have a role to play, and they are able to participate, but they haven't even joined in yet. Just like a citizen that hasn't been born, their rights are already guaranteed. So, please. Okay, um, <coughs> the next comment I have is that um, I, I do think that there needs to be a little bit of an expansion in terms of the, the, um, the topic of this, this um, discussion. You know, I have heard like us touching not just on equitability um, and transparency, but also on effectiveness, and um, and uh, you know we keep hearing policy versus implementation. Even when you have different stakeholders that come to the table, how are we so sure that implementation fails and uh, they they get turned off from the multi-stakeholder model completely because we they've engaged, they've spent all this time and funds and money yeah. to, to get here. And at the end of the day, what is the output? Who's really driving the process? And who audits the process? Thank you. Uh, Chuck, do you want to add something else before the panel um, address these questions? Please. Sure. And uh, several other topics came up of interest <laughs> while I was waiting. <laughs> uh, uh, first of all, let me, let me talk about equitability. I mean. We could spend all day on equitability. It's a loaded term, and you raised the point yourself, Khaled, that, you know, what does it mean? Those are not invalid questions you ask, the, the big corporation versus the small little organization and so forth. Uh, I think the way the GNSO has dealt with that is to try to get away from a voting mechanism and try to reach decisions that most everybody would support regardless of their size or impact, but that's a ongoing challenge. Uh, with, re with regard to uh, participation, which we've talked a lot about today, we have to recognize that you can't force participation. You can't even force representation. You can do things to facilitate it, make it easier. You can make sure it's open and so forth, but the bottom line, you're going to get situations where you don't get good participation, you don't get good representation from some groups. You should try to do that, and I think everybody's saying that. Uh, and, and the only thing you can do then is to be transparent and to show, okay, this group wasn't represented, we tried, here's the efforts we made to, to do that, and we look at ways to do it better in the future, but the bottom line, you're not going to always get uh, the participation from every impacted party. Uh, some will not be represented. Y again, you can't force people uh, to do that. So w we, we have to, to recognize that. Now, just, just one more. I'll just end with one question because the term accountability was, was raised. Can I, can I uh, uh, on the last point you just made, sure. may I interrupt you because I want to uh, okay. pinpoint something here. Let's assume a, in a country A, there is an effort to create a local IGF. Okay? They've tried to reach out to different segments of society so that you have the representation from different segments as we would wish to have. But uh, in some areas, 
you can't force nobody participated. Does that initiative from that country A become recognized as a country A IGF from a global perspective, or does it not get recognized yet because it has not fulfilled the requirement of creating representation from across the board? Well, if you take that position... Uh, it's just a question. I'm no, not taking... Yeah. Yeah. And I'm responding. <laughs> Please. If you take that position, you may as well close the doors because nobody's going to be fully represented. There will okay. always be groups that are, that are isolated. I mean, okay. e the ideal okay. is to try to avoid that situation, but I literally think that if you're that idealistic, you're, you're uh, going to always come up short. Now, we should keep trying to get better. Right. Okay. But I take it back to the Jovan's point earlier on. Uh, no, re no taxation without representation. No implementation without representation is what we're talking about. So if we have a group representing country A that is actually presenting themselves as the multi-stakeholder model of country A, but they are not fully, uh, what's the term I'm looking for, um, uh, uh, fully inclusive. Now, maybe uh, we don't want to close doors, but maybe we can label it al as maybe a multi-stakeholder country A work in progress or something like that. I don't know. I'm just thinking aloud. That's where what transparency comes in. Okay. We should, re you know, hopefully require, I don't know if we could do that, uh, groups to be as clear as possible of, of their level of representation. Mm -hmm. Be honest about the fact that we reached out to these people, they didn't. That's where transparency comes in. So you know what, the, what is missing from their, but th their input is still valuable. You so we, we go back also to the, to the point Musa mentioned earlier on is about documentation. Um, I, I, have a, I have a challenge um, um, coming to terms with expecting or documenting trust, uh, sincere sincerity, as Manal mentioned earlier on. They're all wonderful things, but you can't really um, pinpoint them. So perhaps if a country A is wishing to be represented in IGF, and they are a local country A IGF representative, then what we can say is that you're a work in progress until you've actually uh, 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 documented your processes, who have you reached to, who have, then it can be uh, uh, part of the mechanism. Because this is again going back to Thomas's point. This, uh, nobody can go and attend these international events at all times. You have to find some localization of representation to be able to take it to the, to the, to the global IGF. Just some of the thoughts that uh, uh, would, come, would come across. Yeah, please. Yeah, just, just one last question please. and I'll stop here. Uh, the term accountability was mentioned, and we all believe in accountability, but accountability by itself doesn't mean much. We have to answer the question, accountability to what or to who or whatever. So, and I'll, I'll stop there. No, thank you very much, Chuck. Uh, Thomas, uh, I think we're almost at the end of our session, correct? So, yeah, please. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Emmanuel Edet. I'm from Nigeria, I'm the National Information Technology Development Agency. I work in the legal unit there, so we deal with policy development and regulations. Um, I've listened with rapt attention to the comments being made, and um, I have a few things to say. First of all, we have to recognize that every country has its peculiarities. And so setting a format for countries to follow may not necessarily be in the interest of the countries themselves or the IGF as a whole. Um, for example, in Nigeria, one of the greatest challenges we have in our local IGF is, is funding. If the government does not provide fund to sustain the process, it doesn't work because you cannot get funds anywhere else. And whenever the government provides funds, they are actually interested in the outcome of the process. And it's a bit difficult for you to fund a process that is basically 
set up for the purpose of criticizing your own policies. It's a bit difficult. Um, for me, I think this is my personal opinion. I think one of the best things we could do is to develop a process that puts, that gives trust to every participant. I am avoiding the use of stakeholders or representatives here to every participant because even though we try as much as we can to reach out to the academia, we hardly ever have them represented, even though there are funds for them to come up and make contributions. So in our attempt to provide inclusiveness to every participant, there should be at least some basic, um, what should I call it, some basic features. And one of those basic features you were talking about a word, is trust. That's the key word. If the people trust the process, there will be no need to question the outcome of the process. That's my intervention. Thank you very much. Um, we are just almost at the end of the session, so what we're going to do is we're going to spend the last five minutes, and I'm going to give the panelists the floor to give your interjections to what we've heard from, uh, from our debates and give us your uh, closing comments as well on how we should move forward. So, um, Thomas? Thank you. Actually, uh, I wanted to say the opposite of what you said, so it's very, it's very funny that you raise it. I wanted to say in order to have, make transparency and accountability and all these nice things that we all agree on but it no normally only happens to a limited extent, you need to incite people, and this is what, not always, but in some parts of the Swiss government and Swiss society we do, you need to pay people to criticize you. This is the point. If I can, would do this, if, if other institutions would do this much more, because you only, transparency and accountability only taken serious if somebody, that can be a journalist, it can be a public service broadcaster, that is not broadcasting the political leader party opinion, but is actually asking questions, is what the government is doing that pays my, my job, is this right, what do you think, you people? You need people that criticize you. If they are not there without your funding, you need to fund them, because only then and then I come back to my conclusion, which, is, which has three with checks and balances. You need checks and balances. I don't care, as I said, whether you call it a kingdom or a direct democracy or a representative democracy or multi-stakeholderism. If you have the checks and balances that any decision, any corruption, any, any good or bad thing can be modified in the course of time and, and, and rather sooner than better based on an inclusive process, then the system works. Then you have stability, you normally have better outcomes because you can correct mistakes. And if people know that if they make a mistake, they will be corrected, they have an incentive not to make mistakes in the first run because they are criticized for it. And, 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 and this is, I think, is, is fundamental and we have to find out uh, what are the checks and balances needed in a multi-stakeholder model like ICANN, like others. You have to find the right, and we need to have a constant debate criticizing ourselves, if you're part of the institution or criticizing the institution, if you're working with it, trying to help it improve, and this is the checks and balances that I'm looking for. Thomas, would you say, for example, a checks and balances could be if th there is voting at a local IGF, that there is a transparency in the process of the voting and how that has actually been ascertained so that it can, the result can be legitimate. Would you agree? Okay. Um, and and uh, uh, Walter, you're next. One of the things you mentioned about trust, <coughs> I agree with you, trust needs to be there. I, I would think that trust becomes an outcome if the processes have actually been followed and they have been transparent, they are perhaps documented, uh, election processes are a bit on, uh, you, can, you can trace what happened, then that conclusion leads to trust and then the trust becomes more like the seed planted. I don't know whether we can institutionalize this trust, it, more like the trust is made at, at a consequence of doing it well. Uh, that's my opinion. Walter, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, I strongly agree with what Thomas has said, and I understand what you're saying, so let me comment on that. I, I uh, like agree and understand. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's, well, it, I mean, to an extent, I agree with uh, what Emmanuel has, uh, has said as well. 
uh, I, I think there's not one of us who wouldn't rather be praised than uh, uh, criticized. Uh, and this, is, this flows through every government, whether it is uh, an old democracy or, uh, or authoritarian government. In some of the older democracies, and I would talk about the United States here, there are uh, very interesting constructions in place uh, to protect, for example, I'll use an example where I had an experience, the public broadcasting system, which receives federal money from being controlled uh, in what it says by the federal government, that there is actually institutions whose job is to provide that shield. Um, however, uh, I think that, uh, that it's clear that the kind of multi-stakeholderism that really uh, is, uh, how do I say, succeeds in reaching uh, the, the, the kind of end results that we're all talking about is still aspirational. Uh, and uh, w there are very good and growing number of examples where we see very effective results with feedback loops, uh, or we could call that accountability, that show that there need to be adjustments, there need to be reconsideration, some things are working better than others. However, I think what you're saying, Emmanuel, uh, 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 is that governments and other stakeholders are more likely to take the leap of faith to change the way they consult and allow criticism and make decisions in a multi-stakeholder environment as more and more examples mount of other governments, other entities take it on and succeed so that there is a tipping point at which point it's easier to take that step and make that case internally. I, I go back again to the example of competition. I remember sitting in, um, in the ITU uh, meetings of the Global Symposium for Regulators, and even before that, where there were a couple of handfuls of countries that had independent regulators that were looking at open market decision making, uh, had examples of it, and they were being blocked to the extent possible by most of the other governments saying that's not the way we do things. That's not the way we want to do things. It took a few years of their talking together and sharing examples and seeing the kind of economic development that grew out of opening up markets and the kind of service of markets that there was a tipping point. Now it is rarer for a, for a country not to have some sort of open market approach. Still, it's not the ideal that I think many would like to see, but there is that tipping point, and I would submit that as we go forward and refine and gain experience by, with the multi-stakeholder model in the internet world, but in other aspects of how we do business, we will reach that tipping point where it will be easier for other countries to come on and do that. In the meantime, it's not gonna be perfect, but any experimentation, excuse me, whether it's an IGF that is not quite there or not, is of value because it does begin to move uh, uh, the, the multi-stakeholder model along and a growing comfort with that model. Thank you, Waldo. Um, Musa? Thank you. Um, I think I'll, I'll just keep my comments, my closing comments brief on this. First of all, I'd like to touch on what Emmanuel said, which is um, one size most definitely does not fit all. Okay, so if we are going to talk about an overarching structure, we do need to understand that it, it has to be flexible, it has to be simple, and it has to allow for further structures to take place under it. Okay, because unfortunately what we're seeing, is, and going back to the beginning of this di discussion on, on the, the multi-stakeholder model, is that it's, it's, you, there, there's often an overlooking of cultural peculiarities or legal peculiarities or regional di di differences. And these need to be taken into account and respected. Um, responding to the point about accountability, 
I'd say here, everything comes down to clarity. If you know what's happening, then you know who's accountable, and by extension, you know what corrective actions need, need to be taken. And I really think that in many of our, our models, whether at a national level, regional level, or international level, this clarity is not necessarily there in all cases, or there's not the same understanding between, be, between all. And finally, I'd, I'd like to put a note of caution into what would really negatively impact moving forward with these sort of models. And I think here the, the biggest detriment is noise. We are swamped with information. There is so much information out there, and I'll touch on what Thomas said. We just don't have the time, we don't have the resources to adequately filter it and to adequately understand what is being said. There's just too much out there. And this noise could include even uh, criticism from uh, special interest groups. They, they make such loud noise, that they make, they make such loud comments that they drown out the relevant factors of um, other agencies, other, other participants. So the best way for us to move forward, I think, is to find an effective uh, and fair way of filtering this noise to get down to the, the key decision-making information and make the decisions from that, which would again come back to clarity. So I think I'd end on that. Thank you, Musab. Jovan, you'll have the class closing remark. Please, thank you. Uh, just a few comments. Uh, as John, uh, as uh, John Lennon said, life, life is what happens while we are making big plans. We should uh, aim to do big things about multi stakeholderism, but we should make a concrete and realistic step. At the same time, as Wanda indicated, the, the time is an extremely important comp component. We discussed yesterday that, that Europe needed almost 100 years to introduce. Uh, functional democracy between 1848 when the principles were introduced and it started operating uh, in whole Europe after the Second World War. Therefore, time is an extremely important component. We have to be patient. And that's, uh, that's the, uh, those are essentially the main buildi building blocks uh, in which we have to follow on all of these principles, uh, transparency, uh, accountability, clarity. And I think we have the all ingredients here. What I would introduce is one concept that which uh, was mentioned earlier is a limited, we can call it governance bandwidth, our, our mental bandwidth and institutional bandwidth. We should start from that because we very often focus on choices, possibilities, uh, uh, horizon, uh, 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 blue sky, but ultimately we have limited, uh, well, 24 hours a day and that's... that's what, what would you think about adding, a, let's say, a, a checklist to the to the to the list a checklist that would be a format or a template to be followed would that be helpful for local igfs as well it depends what type of the uh, template the sharing experiences yes sharing experiences, but yes. definitely not the models and the, that that should be uh, up, uh, imposed Excellent. across the board well thank you all very very much uh, we keep it brief in closing uh, i thank the panelists for their excellent interjections and uh, thank you all from the audience as well. And uh, keep an eye on that space. Thank you very much. Enjoy. Bye-bye. <laughs>